That's what we do. <laughs> Let's stand together, please. us to the river lead us there in unity to sing the song of your salvation to win this generation for our king the song of your forgiveness for it is with grace that the river flows take us to the river in the city of our God us to the throne room and give us ears to hear the cry of heaven oh that cry is mercy mercy to the fallen sons of man mercy has triumphed triumphed over judgment by the blood take us to the throne room in the city Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. This is the year of the Lord. Oh, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us. Take us to the mountain, lift us in the shadow of your hands, is this your mighty angel, who stands astride the ocean and the land, in your hand your mercy, showers on the dry end, take us to the mountain, in the city of our God. For the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is upon us to the river lead us there in unity to sing the song of your salvation and win this generation for our king the song of your forgiveness for it is with grace that the river flows take us to the river in the city of our Take us to the river in the city of our God. And take us to the river in the city of our God. Thank you so very much. So I don't know if you've been watching the news about what's going on in Israel. Um, but there were two separate news reports that I saw this week about uh, miracles. And, you know, when people who don't walk with God, as far as we know, or at least not the way we understand it, and are, they're starting to talk about miracles, it really gets my attention. When we talk about miracles, okay. But when others start talking about our God doing miracles, especially people that don't follow our God, now I really got my attention. For example, uh, this Iron Dome operator... You know, the Iron Dome is the missile defense system. Thank you so much. And when Hamas fires a rocket into Israel, you've got to understand, they don't have a long time to figure this thing out. They've got a minute and a half, 60 seconds, 90 seconds. 
from the time it's fired to the time they intercept it, or they're, they're in big trouble. So what the Iron Dome system does is it sees the trajectory, calculates wind, and then shoots and blows it up in the air. So there's one coming in. They calculated the trajectory. It was going to land on the Knesset, which is the Jewish Congress. It's their Senate. It's their seat of government. And uh, the guy who was operating the system, you know, told the thing to fire. It didn't fire. Told it to fire again. It didn't fire again. And now it's too late. And he said, from out of nowhere, a gust of wind came and blew it into the sea. The hand of God, huh? Yep. That's exciting enough. But then they interviewed a terrorist. And the question was, you guys are shooting thousands of rockets into Israel. And you're not hitting anybody. What's going on? Don't you know how to use them? He says, their God is interfering and keeping the missiles from hitting. Now, I'm sorry, but if that's what the guy thinks, why is he still in Hamas? <laughs> you know, he should be converting tomorrow. So this is the kind of stuff that's going on in Israel right now. You, you, I mean, you think about it. Thousands upon thousands of rockets from right next door. I mean, from the distance of within Tucson. And nobody's getting hurt. This is divine. When God chooses to protect his people, nothing can stop him. And I'm thankful that we're at a time in history where we're seeing his blessing and not his judgment. That could be right around the corner. We don't know. But as it sits right now, it's pretty exciting. And um, now, that's the good news. The sad news is there are Christian people throughout the Middle East who are being executed and threatened on a daily basis. This uh, ISIS group, which is trying to take over everything, um, they're basically moving in and saying, you have three options. You can leave the country convert to Islam, be executed, or pay a tax. And then you can stay here as a persecuted Christian paying a tax. Now, obviously, the only one for most of us would be, okay, I'll pay the tax. But imagine if they came up to you and said, Rich, you've got to pay a tax or be executed or convert to Islam. And you're like, okay, I'll pay the tax. Okay, that would be $50,000. I don't have $50,000. Well, then you have to convert to Islam or be executed. That's what's going on throughout the Middle East right now. A lot of these people are being killed. A lot of them are, are running for their lives. They're, they're, they're in a bad place. So I just ask that you would think of them. They're your brothers and sisters. Pray for them on a regular basis that God would show them mercy and deliverance. And uh, I know we were praying not too long ago for that woman, that, that mother who was thrown into prison and they were gonna execute her and they released her. So, you know, God does amazing things. So keep, keep these folks in prayer. Speaking of God, um, some of you are gonna know the answer to this question, but maybe you haven't seen it laid out the way I'm gonna lay it, lay it out. So it's for your benefit, it's also for the benefit of those who have not yet found God and for you to help people find God. How do you find God? How do you draw close to God? That's what I wanna talk about this morning. You know, I've got this, awesome thing on my phone. You probably got it too. It's a GPS. And I just plug in an address or a destination, you know, and it'll tell me how to get there, turn by turn. Domino's Pizza. Great. And it'll take me to the closest Domino's Pizza. Um, I can drive anywhere in the country, and it'll take me turn by turn to that spot. But how do you find God? Right. Is there like a map? Oh, yeah. Take a left. It's different finding God. But the Bible is kind of like the map. It's kind of like the GPS. It tells us how to find God. So um, Deuteronomy 4.29, if you've been reading through the Bible with us through the year, you came across this passage just this week. Um, here's what it said. Deuteronomy 4.29, if you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and with all your soul. If somebody was to quote this passage of scripture to you, if you seek for the Lord, you will find him and left it at that, they didn't tell you the whole story. It does not say, if you seek the Lord, you will find him. It says, if you seek for the, for the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul, you will find him. 
I know a lot of people who've sought for God. Hey, God, if you're there, let me know. No? Okay, he's not there. I've got a friend. I'll, I'll be back there in a minute. You just hold on to that for me, okay? Thanks. So I've got a friend. He is single. He's a bachelor. And he's looking for a bride. And it's not going as quickly as he had hoped. And I'm thinking, that's awesome. Let's say it takes five years. Then you can tell her, I've been searching for you for five years. You see, things of value are not always easily attainable. You with me? Sometimes you got to look hard for that perfect somebody, that perfect job, that perfect house, that perfect tuna melt sandwich. <laughs> God told ancient Israel, there's a context to that verse. He said, I've just given you the law, and I've told you how to have a close relationship with me. But if you turn your back on me and break my laws and worship other gods, I will disperse you to the four corners of the earth where you will serve other gods. But from there, if you repent, if you seek the Lord your God, you will find him if you look for him with all your heart and all your soul. See, what I did is I, I left my notes up here from yesterday and I didn't want you to see them. So we're working with the word seek here. God told ancient Israel if they would seek for him, they would find him. If they sought, searched with all their heart and soul. But first, what was going to happen, and I just read it to you, or referenced it to you. He said, if you sin, I'm going to scatter you. I'm running out of paper. To the ends of the earth. So I'm a young man young adult, got a job. I'm working in a place called Rancho Cucamonga. Now, how many of you have ever heard of Cucamonga? Let me see your hands. Wow, all of you? That's amazing. Jose, I didn't even look at you. I knew you've probably been there. <laughs> Southern California, yeah. Southern California, yeah. I'm surprised. You know, the first time I heard of Cucamonga was on um, Bugs Bunny. You ever seen that cartoon? Yeah, he's talking about Cucamonga. I thought it was a joke. And then I got, a, I got a job there. Now, for those of you who don't know me, I happen to be Jewish. So I'm reading a passage of Scripture for the first time reading the Bible that God tells the Jewish people that if they fall into sin, he will scatter them to the other, uttermost ends of the earth. I'm in a place called Cucamonga. I'm figuring if that's not a fulfillment of prophecy, I don't know what is. You know, look at the map. I go from Israel to Cucamonga. My people must have done something really bad. But the part of the scripture that grabbed my attention was, from there, if you seek the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, you will find him. Please understand, I was not looking for Jesus. I'm Jewish. Not only was I not interested in Jesus, I was disinterested in Jesus. I was prejudiced against Jesus. I saw Jesus as the God of the enemy, in a sense, because, you know, anti-Semitism is a big thing. So maybe not the enemy, but at least people who don't like me, it's their God. Why would I be interested in their God? But I sought for God with all my heart, and I sought for God with all my soul, and he kept flashing Jesus in my face. And finally I went, oh, I get it. He's the Savior. He's the Messiah. I didn't know. And I wouldn't have known if I didn't look with all my heart and all my soul. But see, I didn't come to God with rules. I didn't say, you know, God, I will follow you if I like the rules, if I like the system you put into place. But if I don't like them, nah. And that's what a lot of people do, you know. Sure, I'll follow God, but I'm not giving up my girlfriend. Well, what if God doesn't want you to have that girlfriend? Well, then I don't want God. Well, okay. You just decided your girlfriend's more important than God. You've made your decision. Well, why would God want to take away my girlfriend? From That's not the point. He may, he may not. The point is, who's your God? Who's in charge? 
And I've seen it go that way because your girlfriend happens to be somebody else's wife, you idiot. <laughs> what are you going to do? What are you going to do? Okay, so they sin. They're scattered. They seek God. How do we seek God? Okay, I know we're supposed to seek God, but how do we do it? What actual practical things can we do to seek God? The first I've already hinted at is the Bible. Read the Bible. The Bible is the guide map to God. The Bible itself says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So if you want to know God, you want to find God, read the book he wrote. Um, you know, the regulars here, you know I, I kind of into biblical archaeology and biblical history. I love the word of God, but I also like reading what historians of those days said about their culture, their time, and Bible people. I love that stuff. I'm kind of geeky that way. But if I wanted to know something about an ancient famous person and they wrote a book, I'd want to read that book, right? Doesn't that just make sense? If I want to know everything that there is to know about Benjamin Franklin, I want to read a book Benjamin Franklin wrote. If he wrote an autobiography, now I really want to read it. You following me? Well, if you want to know God, you should read the book he wrote. Now, I know he didn't write it with his own pen. He inspired people to write it. Sometimes he told them exactly what to say. Sometimes he infused it into their being. But this is his book. And so I would encourage you to start there if you want to draw close to God. One of the other ways of drawing close to God is talk to somebody who already knows him. And this seems to be one of the most common ways people find God. I told you I was reading the Bible, I read that passage of scripture, but that wasn't the whole story. It seemed like after that passage of scripture came out of my mouth, God, I'm looking for you, there were Christians coming at me from every angle telling me about Jesus. Now you have to understand, this has never happened in my life before. So this isn't like, oh yeah, more of the same or coincidence. I live my whole life and nobody's preaching Jesus to me. I go looking for God, and everybody's preaching Jesus to me. Now, how does that happen? Have you ever had that experience? Yeah. So I just wanted to YouTube, Google YouTube, people looking for God and how they found him, and I found the story of a woman from another country who had a similar experience. And so I've got a video for her. If we can kill the lights and take a look at her, her video, her story. I would like to share a story with you about a girl. This girl was from Holland and she was about 20 years old when this all started. She was raised in a non-Christian family. They never went to church. They owned two Bibles, but they were never taken off the bookshelf. The girl went to university and around that time she started asking herself questions. Questions like, who am I? What am I doing here on earth? What is life worth living for? Is it all meaningless? Before she knew it, she got depressed. She didn't want to admit her situation. At the same time, she began to notice the fate of some Christian friends. There was something they had that she admired, something that made her curious. The girl was a little bit shy to admit that. She always said she didn't believe those things. She didn't know where to turn to. She was curious about the Christian faith, and she had these important life questions, but she didn't dare to share those with her friends. On a Sunday she was sitting at home and she felt like doing something with those questions which had been dominating her life for quite a while then. That afternoon she went on the internet. She opened Google and typed in searching God. Immediately Google gave some results. At the top of the page there was iksukgod.nl, which is translated knowinggod.net. She clicked on the page and she uh, read the things about God and Jesus. And even though she didn't understand everything, it looked like these were the things she had been searching for. She went to the last page. On that page there was a prayer and she prayed. Maybe most of you already guessed it. That girl was me. The same night I visited the webpage, I signed up for an alpha course. After the third evening, I began to understand it more. 
and I decided that I believed it all. I started to know God in a personal way. I found a church, I slowly started to grow, and I got baptized. I became a Who knew, right? Google saves lives. She sought God with all her heart, and she found him. So I told you there's going to be three steps for drawing close to God. The first one is seek him. Uh, the second one is pray to him. Deuteronomy 4.7, it says, What other nation is so great as to have their gods near them the way the Lord our God is near us whenever we pray to him? The way the Lord our God is near to us when we pray to him. So God told ancient Israel that he would always hear their prayers. God always hears the prayers of sincere seekers. I always like to tell people two things about prayer just right up front. God hears and God cares. He hears because he's capable. He's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's omniscient. He knows all things. And he cares, and that's why he listens. So to draw close to God, seek, seek him, pray, pray to him, and thirdly, obey him. Deuteronomy 4.2. Do not add to what I command you, and do not subtract from it. But keep the commands of the Lord your God that I give you. So we're looking at the context of how to draw close to God, and the context talks about obedience. There is no way a person can be close to God while they're disobeying God. True story. I think it was the woman. You know, sadly, I've heard more than one of these stories. I've experienced them. Uh, cheating on her husband, decided to divorce her husband, and said she now feels closer to God than she has in the longest amount of time. She felt close to God while she was cheating on her husband and divorcing him? I don't know a lot of things, but I know this, she was not close to God. Why did she feel close to God? I don't know, she was deluded. Here's what I think, though. She was living under guilt, and that guilt and that sinful awareness was keeping her distant from God, and she knew it. She finally decided, I'm not going to feel guilty anymore. I don't care. I'm doing, I'm doing what I want to do. I'm not going to feel condemned for it anymore. It's what I got to do. So the guilt went away, and so now she felt okay. She felt good. She felt free. She felt free because her heart was hardened. She wasn't close to God. If anything, her relationship to God was severed. It's kind of like, oh, my hand doesn't hurt anymore. Because you cut it off! That's not better than it's being sore. It's not better. But it felt better. We cannot be close to God while we're disobeying God. Deuteronomy 7.12. If you pay attention to these laws and are careful to follow them, then the Lord your God will keep his covenant of love with you as he swore with your forefathers. Jesus said this. He was talking to a big Jewish crowd. Many of those people were not listening, but a group was. And here's what he said to them. So Jesus told those Jews who believed in him, if you continue in my word, you really are my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. How many of you have heard that? You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Let me, yeah, it's very common. It's quoted a lot. But how many of you heard before, if you continue in my word? That part's never quoted. We always take the part we like, and we leave out the other part. Yeah, you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free if you continue in the word of Jesus. If you don't, you will not. So the third part in drawing close to God is obedience to God. There's a passage of Scripture that's chanted by Jewish people all over the world. In fact, it's the most well-known passage of Scripture in all the Jewish world. And um, it's been turned into a chant. And if there's anything a Jewish person knows, it'll be that chant. And it's Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4, and it's called the Shema. But just like the other verses, there's a context to it. So most Jewish people know the Shema. And it says in English, hear, O Israel, or listen up, O Israel. But there's a context to it. Listen. Hear, O Israel, and be careful to obey so that it may go well with you and that you may increase greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey, just as the Lord, the God of your fathers, promised you. Now here's the verse they know. 
Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That's the chant. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. But right before that, in verse 3, it said, Hear, O Israel. And then it talked about obeying. And then verse 4, it talked about God's unity. And then verse 5, it talks about obeying God. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be upon your hearts. So, we're still in Deuteronomy. That was the passage I pulled out to talk to you about how to draw close to God. That's the chapter from which I got my three points. Seek Him, pray to Him, and obey Him. And in Deuteronomy, two chapters later, we've got this famous passage of Scripture, but even that's couched in obedience terms. But we go back to our original chapter, chapter 4, and the same verbiage is used. Listen, chapter 4, verse 1. Hear now, O Israel, the decrees and the laws I am about to teach you. Follow them so that you may live and may go in and take possession of the land that the Lord, the God of your fathers, is giving you. And then chapter 5. Moses summoned all Israel and said, Hear, O Israel, the decrees and laws I declare in your hearing today. Learn them and be sure to follow them. So three ways to draw close to God. Seek him, pray to him, and obey him. Maybe it was my upbringing. Maybe it's just human nature. Seek him, makes sense. Pray to him, makes sense. Obey him, ooh. I don't like that word obedience. I don't like it. I don't like the word submission. I don't like rules and regulations. I don't like people telling me what to do. I want to do whatever I want to do. You know, I can make up my own rules. So recently, you know, I got to teach my oldest son how to drive, my second son how to drive, my daughter how to drive. Joseph's next, a couple years, teach Joseph how to drive. And it's all about rules. And I guess I kind of do like rules. Because when you come to a four-way stop, the rule says stop. And what happens if you don't stop? Good chance there's going to be an accident. And if you're going 45 miles an hour, it could even be a fatality. You can T-bone somebody. You can do a head-on. It could be ugly. So why is that rule bad? Well, that rule's not bad. That's a good rule. So, Steve, you don't hate rules? Well, some rules. How about the rule that says slow down in a school crossing zone and don't pass other vehicles in that passing zone? Somebody didn't do that in Reed Ranch a couple years ago and a little child died. Well, that, that rule's good. Well, what about the rule that says, you know, don't kick in somebody's door and rob from them? You know, home invasions, that's wrong. Well, that, that's a good rule, too. Well, what about the rule that says don't litter? Well, yeah, I hate people who litter. What about the rule? You know, I, I don't like rules, but then I sit down and I think about the rules, and I kind of like rules. <laughs> rules make society livable, make society pleasant, help us to deal well with one another. You think about it, life is full of rules. The rules that say the people at Fry's can't tell you that produce is 33 cents a pound and then turn their scale down 33 cents, so you're paying twice. That's against the rules. And I'm glad that's against the rules. We could talk all day about rules we like. My point is, God's rules are for our benefit. They're no different than stop, don't speed, don't pass in a crossing zone, don't turn down the scale. In fact, that turn, don't turn down the scale one is actually in the Bible multiple times. God hates a dishonest balance and scale, it says in Scripture. So now I realize, you know what, Steve? It's just you've had a bad attitude. Rules are good when they come from God because they help people get along better. They help society function better. They make life safer. They make people happier. I guess I'm okay with rules. Seek him, pray to him, and obey him. One more thing, and then I'll let you go, but it's going to take a moment to get through. Um, There's a warning passage about seeking God that I have to share with you. Because it's, you know, if I gave you just the good parts and didn't give you the warning, I wouldn't be doing my job. And this one comes from Isaiah 55. It says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the evil man his thoughts. Let him turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on him and to our God and he will freely pardon. So I'm in Cucamonga. I lived in uh, Colton at this time. 
And I read the passage of scripture that said, seek the Lord and you will find him. So I prayed to him. Then sometime later, I got to Isaiah and it said, seek the Lord while he may be found. Now I got nervous. There's obviously a time limit on this thing. There's obviously a time when he won't be found. So it gave me a sense of urgency. I was listening to a pastor on the radio the other day. I think it was Scott Richards. I enjoy listening to him. And he was talking about people who um, will put off God, thinking, you know, I'll think about God maybe when I'm older, sown all my oats, had all the fun I want to have, lived for myself, then at the very end I can follow God and still get into heaven. I can have my cake and eat it too. But his point was, if you spend every day for the next 30 years saying no to God, 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 what makes you think in 30 years you're going to know how to say anything else? You've so burned it into your soul that you've pretty much shut the door to yes to God. You've convinced yourself, and you've shut the door. And he's right, that's a biblical concept. And I think part of this passage, I mean, one of the interpretations of the seek the Lord while he may be found means exactly that. There's a guy in scripture, his name, Pharaoh. He was a king of Egypt. And it says that he hardened his heart. And the scripture says God hardened his heart. And it got to a point where Pharaoh was so hard that even his own people were telling him, leave these people alone. They're just... You know, we're destroyed. And Pharaoh kept hardening his heart until he died. He couldn't even talk about common sense. I talked about that Hamas guy just at the beginning of my lesson. He's recognizing that the God of Israel is protecting them, and he's still shooting missiles. He said no too long. There's no hope for people like that. It says in the Bible, in the book of Romans, read the first couple of chapters, that people who constantly turn their back against God... God turns them over to a reprobate mind. God gives them up. God abandons them to exactly what they want. That's not a good place to be. There's a passage in, I think it's Thessalonians, it talks about the end times when the Antichrist comes and he's deluding people. That God will send the people a strong delusion also. That they might believe the Antichrist's lie. Why would God do that? Because they've gone from being potentially children to pawns. They've shut themselves off to the point where they're no longer going to come to God. It says because they refused to acknowledge and love the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They rejected the truth, so God has cut them off. Jeremiah the prophet was commanded by God at one point in Israel's history to stop praying for them. A prophet not allowed to pray for his own people? Yeah, let me read to you what happened. Uh, Jeremiah 11. They have returned to the sins of their forefathers who refused to listen to my words. They have followed other gods to serve them. Both the house of Israel and the house of Judah have broken the covenant I made with their forefathers. Therefore, this is what the Lord says. I will bring on them a disaster they cannot escape. Although they cry out to me, I will not listen to them. Do not pray for this people, nor offer any plea or petition for them, because I will not listen when they call to me in the time of their distress. There can come a time when somebody has said no to God so many times that God is done with them. It can even happen to an entire nation. That is scary, and that's the warning. We're told to seek for God, to search for him with all of our hearts, to repent of our sin, and we will find him. But we're also told to seek while he may be found. He's not going to allow people to reject him forever. Eventually he will say, are you sure that's your decision? Last, last chance. And then he'll cut them off. And that's a horrible, horrible place to be. I believe that right now, especially because of what we're seeing going on in Israel with these miracles, I think God is calling out to people. That's the way he does it. He uses us. He uses miracles. He uses the Bible. God is calling out to people. Listen to a song coming to church this morning. It was this? I don't remember the words. Maybe you've heard it on the radio. Um, I was thinking about all the struggles in the world and people dying and children being abused, and I raised my fist to God and said, why don't you do something? 
And God said, I did do something. I created you. And then the guy goes, ha, I get it. <laughs> we can do something. Hopefully you got my email this week that talked about that. Praying for people is doing something. Spreading word against hate is doing something. But the first thing you need to do is to answer that call. If God is calling out to you, don't tell him no anymore. Tell him yes. Turn from your sin. Pledge to follow Jesus. Or as the scripture says, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Right after church, the prayer room will be opened. If you'd like to give your life to Christ, there will be people in there who can pray with you. Or if you just want to go in there and pray about something else, there will be people in there to pray for you. But I would like to ask the worship team to come on up. And please, while they're getting set, please join me in prayer. Lord God, thank you for sending Jesus. And thank you for giving us the Bible to show us how to find you. Thank you for the Bible. And thank you for other people who have found you first to tell us about you. Now help us to be those people, to tell others about you. May you continue to do your great miracles. May you deliver your people in Israel. And we pray for your saints scattered throughout the Middle East who are being abused right now, that you would deliver them as well. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's stand together, please.
Well, I hope you don't make me wait till next Sunday to see your shining faces again. Hopefully you'll be here on Wednesday night. Have a fabulous week. God bless you hard. I'll see you Wednesday night.